Well, good evening, everybody. My name is David Ringer with the National Audubon Society, and I'm here with... Hello, everyone. I am Christine from Audubon. We've got a very special guest with us here tonight, Melissa Villasenor. We'll introduce her in just a moment, um, but we're going to be hosting a brand new web series with the National Audubon Society called I Saw a Bird, Audubon Spring Migration Show. So every week, we're going to be inviting you to join us for a very special conversation uh, about birds and bird migration. Yeah, and this is a great way for everybody to enjoy nature together, especially because a lot of us are in our own homes right now. Um, and speaking of today, I did look out my window. I saw a tree. I didn't see a bird, but I think I heard an American robin, which is really nice. Um, David, did you see or hear any birds today? I did. Uh, I live in New York City and I saw a bird today. It was a common raven and common raven is a bird that uh, looks a lot like a crow. They're much bigger. They have a wedge shaped tail, which is the easiest way to tell the difference. Uh, and they've started to come back into some of the big cities in the Northeast and, and find a way to thrive here among, among all the people. Um, so that was a nice thing to see today. We are going to have very special guests as part of our show each week. And we are super excited and honored to have Melissa Villasenor joining us today. Hello, Melissa. <laughs> hey, Christine. Hey, Hi, David. Thank you for having me. Oh, do I see you guys there? Oh, sorry. Oh, breaking out the binoculars already. <laughs> so Melissa is a cast member on Saturday Night Live. And you are also a stand-up comedian, you're a skilled impressionist, you're a singer, an artist, and also a birder. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I'm, I would, I'm very new to birds, although I've always loved, yeah, I, I have a bird watching hobby time on Wednesdays that I've been doing Instagram live stream and that's where I met you guys and you started saying hello to me and uh, really made my made me so happy. Um, I've been a long time fan and yeah, this is really cool to be here. I want to learn. I know I'm going to learn later from you guys um, a lot and yeah, I have my questions ready and what I usually like to do Wednesdays is draw birds and place them around my house and find them with my binoculars. So do yeah, I, love yeah. seeing, I love seeing your, your show that you do every Wednesday <laughs> and how you like play the bird calls and then just turn it to your window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I have fun guests and comedians join in and yeah, a lot of it is not real. They're not real facts, but I, I love it. Yeah. And it's a great way to just enjoy and birds. Melissa, for sure. What's your Instagram handle, Melissa, for people who want to follow along? Yes. My Instagram handle is Melissa V Comedy. Melissa V Comedy. And you'll be live drawing bird on Wednesday morning tomorrow, right? Mm hmm Yep. 11 a.m. Pacific time and uh, 2 p.m. East Coast time. So see you there. Uh, do you want me well, to? We're also going to get to it, see some of that right now. Yes. Can I, is it time for me to begin? Yes. We'd Please love go to see it. what you've got for us. All right. So I want to share, actually, I should give a little backstory. When I, uh, in my early 20s, I was still living at my parents' house and I was um, not sure what to do, but I got involved with Pointy Hills Habitat Authority which is we would take kids at, from local schools and take them on trailheads around in the city of Whittier and Pointe Hills and teach them about nature and wildlife there and birds. And I remember getting a book and I fell in love with the Anna's Hummingbird because that's one that's around here. So I started to draw it. Uh, I love them because they're just so, they're quick and they're beautiful and, and they're pink here. And, uh, and green is here. And so I wanna draw, I wanna finish coloring that right now. But I grew up, I was thinking about it, I grew up with birds, like canaries were always in my house. Like my mom loved canaries. We uh, just would sit in the backyard and listen to them sing. We had a Tweety, a yellow canary, <laughs> to like Tweety bird. And then we had a white one, Casper. I guess, you know, poor guy, he was a little ghost. 
but they're really cute. <laughs> uh, yeah, they they were with us a long time, and uh, yeah, I just love I just love birds. I think there's something so soothing. I think that's what it is. That's why I fell in love with bird watching was because just to listen to them and put your full attention on like, oh, look at his little stripe there, that color there, what kind of bird is that? It just always made me curious and it just calms me really. Um, and I think they're just so pretty. I mean, they could fly and sing. That's gorgeous. Flying and singing. Damn. So, uh, so I'm true. yeah, that's like so beautiful. What are you going to do today? Fly and sing. Okay, gorgeous <laughs> creature. It's so quiet. Creep I know it's a little creepy quiet out there right now, but you can just, I, I've been paying attention to the birdies and um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that your dog behind you right there? Oh, yes. I should share it. This is Sweet Penny. She's my little girl. I adopted her last March. She's a little, I don't know what she is, but she's beautiful. She's a cutie. Uh, she's been such a good pal of mine. I mean, every day, but especially during these days. And yeah, she's a little sweetie. Very she looks sweet. so Very relaxed cute. right now. So cozy. And it's How do you think like she feels about birds? Oh, she chases after them. She, want, she wants to like uh -oh. run and, and then, no, but she's never hurt one. Don't worry, Audubon birds, <laughs> birders out there. She just will, she'll run towards and then they fly, of course. Um, so I think she likes them. Yes. So let me put in this pink. Well, while you're color, yeah. yeah, while you're coloring that Anna's hummingbird, I mean, I think what you were saying, Melissa, about the peace and joy that birds bring all the time, but certainly during a time like this where people are dealing with so much stress and in some cases real grief. Um, I mean, we're hearing from a lot of folks all over the country who are looking to birds. And for me, I think birds remind us what it's like to be free. And there's something so uplifting about watching them go about their day, as you said. Yeah. Oh, man, I forgot. Sorry. I meant to do this in ink before the pencil. I mean, after the pencil. Wow, I'm getting a little uh, um, little starstruck out here or something. Or nervous. <laughs> Likewise, I'm sure. So, Christine, you're in Dallas. What birds are you seeing around you these days? So, I've been hearing a lot of birds around my yard. I'm lucky to have access to a backyard. Um, I think I've been seeing grackles, so I do appreciate mm -hmm. some grackles even though um, they are invasive. But I have, I've heard robins. I've seen a lot of robins just like grazing on the meadows, on the ground, looking for worms. And I think I've heard house finches. So yeah, there's a lot of birds all around. It's great because I can just open my window and hear all the bird songs come in. Yeah, I guess we're That's all great. in different I... flyways today. So I'm, in, I'm here in Texas, even though I'm based in New York. So Central Flyway, David, you're on the East Coast. And yep, Melissa. I'm in New York City, which is in the Atlantic Flyway. And I'm in California. Where we have, flyway. we also have red-tailed hawks here. That's something I've learned. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're really cool. They're cool. So Melissa, you were talking about, you know, what do you do when you're a bird that day? You sing and you fly. Um, and that got me thinking, you did this series for Mas Mejor called Daily Itineraries, where you were impersonating a celebrity going about their days. Uh, and I wondered if you've ever thought about what you would do for the daily itinerary of a bird and how you might do an impersonation of a bird. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, a bird doing a da daily itinerary? Um, yeah. I guess... Uh, I think it would, a bird would be like, well, uh, wake up in the morning and, uh, okay, uh, wait, I'm gonna sing my song, get some, get some worms. Yes, I gotta get some worms and some, some nuts and some bread. If, uh, if someone leaves a little bread, get some bread at, 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 a, at 7 a.m. And, and then I'll fly, I'll fly for a few hours around, go say hi to my family and then go sit on a branch and sing some more and then, and then I don't know, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the Very light. good. Yeah, that is that is exactly yeah. to me. Yeah. 
<laughs> Is that an homage to your, your Tweety Bird from what, your childhood? Yeah. Now, do all birds like to fly in a pack? Or are there some that are like, no thanks, I'm okay, see ya? It's a good question. Uh, so some birds do have a more solitary lifestyle. You mentioned red-tailed hawks a minute ago. And you know, you'll typically see just one hawk perched on a tree or on a fence post or on even a light pole. Um, so they tend to hang out more by themselves. But about this time of year, in a lot of parts of the United States, you can actually see hawks sitting side by side because they've started to pair up. Um, so that's one of the few times when you'll see them together. But otherwise, they kind of spring hunt fever. by themselves and do their own thing. What's that? Is that for spring fever? It's spring <laughs> fever, that's right. <laughs> Um, but then other birds you'll find in flocks year round and they do that because it makes it easier to find food when you have more pairs of eyes looking for food. Uh, it also makes it easier to spot danger when you've got more pairs of eyes looking around. So uh, Christine was talking about seeing grackles in Dallas, maybe great tailed grackles there. Um, and they tend to be pretty um, social all year round. Um, so kind of like people, birds have their different habits and personalities. So we have one from Mary Beth. Mary Beth says um, in Massachusetts, she sees finches, cardinals, robins, and house wrens. Um, Carol from Fort Lauderdale saw a male cardinal today and a woodpecker and plenty of mockingbirds. And then Gail in Illinois sees yellow-bellied sapsuckers, which is a first for Gail, <laughs> um, fox sparrows, house finches, robins, and downy, hairy, and red-bellied woodpeckers. Wow, it's a lot of woodpeckers. I saw a yellow belly sapsucker the other day here in New York City as well. Um, I'm trying to stay inside as much as I can, like many of us, because it's one of the best things we can do to save lives right now. Um, but I, I can walk down to the Hudson River Park, um, not too far from where I live, uh, maintain a proper social distance. And I had this beautiful adult male uh, yellow belly sapsucker on a tree trunk in the sunshine. And, you know, it was one of those moments, Melissa, that you were describing before of just real peace. Uh, and feeling like everything was okay, seeing that beautiful bird tapping on the tree trunk, just doing his thing. Yeah, I feel like it's, they're teaching just to me to, you could just take things slow. I think that's what's happening. Everything just, these days feel slower, but it's okay to just, I don't know, just be with the bird and feel, just be there for a minute, for a bit, you know, I don't know. It's nice, nice to see that nature. I like your earrings, by the way, Melissa. They kind of look like hummingbirds. Yeah, I dressed up for you guys, okay? Just because we're inside and home doesn't mean you can't <laughs> still dress. I, I, I've noticed just color is, is important right now, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good point. Okay. How's, your, how's your hummingbird looking? Okay, it's good. I'm doing some little shading. See all those little lines that really helps give the um dimensions i love that looks i love amazing. yeah that's it's my favorite um i do have an art account it's called melissa v art because there's more emotional stuff it's not all comedy so if you're if you like drawings and stuff go ahead and check it out oh my sister had a question she says is is are there any dinosaurs that are an ancestor to birds like is, I don't know, she asked T-Rex, but is there a pterodactyl or I don't know, are, do dinosaurs at all connect with birds? That's a great question. Uh, and maybe to answer that, we can introduce our next couple of guests that'll join while Melissa continues to be with us and work on her drawings. Um, we've got two special guests who are going to join us now. Uh, Ken Kaufman is a field guide author. He's an artist. He's a naturalist. He's one of the preeminent experts on birds in this country. He's also a field editor for Audubon Magazine. Uh, and Perbita Saha is a senior editor at Popular Science Magazine. Um, she's a scientist and she's a former Aud Audubon Magazine editor as well. And she's part of her local Audubon chapter, Bergen County Audubon in New Jersey. Um, so Ken and Perbita, let's bring you on in. And Ken, uh, maybe we can have you field the question from Melissa's sister about birds and dinosaur linkages. 
and then we can start taking some uh, other migration questions from our panel. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, when I was a little kid, um, I was really interested in the idea of uh, dinosaurs. And so it wasn't that hard for me to switch over to birds when I was about six years old. And it's, you know, it's great to know we still have these dinosaurs with us. And it's, um, it's sort of odd. The, the flying dinosaurs like pterodactyls are really not the, the ancestors of modern birds. Um, the, you know, there, there's debate about exactly which group, you know, unfortunately, they're not little Tyrannosaurus rex either. Um, but the, uh, the birds are, they definitely have their roots in, in dinosaurs. And there, there were actual birds with feathers around before the major extinction of dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. So, you know, there were birds flying around and saying, hey, you know, dinos. <laughs> and Ken, isn't it true that we're finding more and more prehistoric fossils with feathers? So that might kind of be changing how paleontologists and even scientific illustrators um, characterize and portray some of these world famous dinosaurs like T-Rexes. Yeah, absolutely. I just imagine, I mean, you know, for something like Jurassic Park, you have these things looking monstrous and so on, but they probably had like beautiful feathers. And, you know, if you were being chased by a T-Rex, you know, at least you'd know that something beautiful was about to eat you. So uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the feathers That's go way back. Look at it. <laughs> and one of my favorite facts about the Jurassic Park movies, or at least one of the recent ones, um, I remember we had a writer for Audubon magazine unearth that the actual dinosaur so sounds that they used were mating calls from different um, existing birds, so like penguins and ptarmigans. Huh. That's interesting. They probably just made it like really low and loud and like very T-Rexy. <laughs> yeah, they put their TikTok spin on it. I don't know. <laughs> like a remix of Bird yeah. Call. Boy, well, there I, are some... Oh. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Last week I, I found a, a, a barn owl in my, in my home. And uh, I gotta say, barn oh, owls... Yeah, barn owls... Boy, they have uh, like horror movie sounds. <laughs> have you heard them? I just want to show it to you guys because it, it was really... It was something. I don't know yeah, if that's play, true. Play, play. Is that true, though? Are, are they spooky? They sound terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Here it goes. Wait for it. I think they're so cool. I, I would love to see one. I've never seen one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a really horrible screech. <laughs> It's a lovely thing well, to hear in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, Ken and Perbita, um, maybe starting with you, Perbita, um, we're in a period of migration. So what are some of your recent observations? And, and also, can you define migration for us, uh, each in your own way? Yeah. Sure. Um, so as someone who works with words, I completely overthought this. but. Um, yeah, migration is a pretty general term, you know, it, it describes a behavior that's expressed usually in a condensed window of time over a mass of living things. Um, and it can be driven by impulse and it can also be, well, mostly and usually is driven by this need to go elsewhere and find resources and continue to survive. So it's a mechanism for survival. Um, and we see it in a lot of birds, um, you know, twice each year because they're flying north and then they're flying back down south. Um, but we also see it in everything from caribou to moths to um, fish. And you'll even have human migration events. So. Yeah, it's not, it's not just limited to birds, even though that's where our greatest experience lies. Um, and in terms of things that I'm observing to cue spring migration so far, uh, I am seeing all the robins in the world. Um, you know, every field is just full of them and they're just yakking away from the trees. Uh, so it's been robin season so far. 
um, but I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the turnover of new species. That's all I've seen. I've only seen robins. So Ken, how would you define migration? Um, well, for me, I thought Perbita gave a great uh, definition and I think of it as being both uh, science and magic. I mean, I've been studying migration for years and it still seems to me like just a miraculous thing. And uh, one of the things that makes it fascinating is that there are billions of birds passing through, uh, but it's largely an invisible phenomenon because either they're flying high or they're flying at night. And so you know, we may not see them going by, but you can look out your window and see a bird that just arrived from South America. And so it's, it's a huge phenomenon, but one that's easy to overlook. Um, and Ken wrote a new book last year, I believe it came out, um, where he puts together all these great backstories of birds migrating through the Americas. Um, and just the range is amazing. Like you have your shorebirds that can travel thousands of miles to get up to the Arctic um, from the southern tip of South America. But then, you know, Ken, you also talked about the Blue Jays and, um, you know, some of the other common backyard birds in Ohio. Uh, that might just go from patch to patch. Yeah, you know, people think of blue jays as not being migratory because you can see them around all year uh, in the eastern two thirds of the of the country. But there is this northward movement that isn't really obvious until they run to, into an obstacle. Like I live in northern Ohio, and the blue jays come up to the edge of Lake Erie, and then they sort of pause and mill around for a while, and you realize, hey, we've got all these blue jays arriving from the south. And it's just, uh, it's one of those amazing spectacles. You know, blue jays are such noisy birds, but these migratory flocks, you see this flock of migrating blue jays up there and they're totally silent. And it's like, wait, what? So, you know, just this total change in behavior while they're migrating. And Ken, another question that we had from the audience tonight is about another common backyard bird and that's robins. Uh, robins are thought of as being migratory. Do they actually leave during the winter? Are they here all winter? What's the deal with robins? Well, it's, it's complicated. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of robins do migrate, um, but there's still flocks that, are, that remain through the winter up near the northern edge of the range. Like where I am in northern Ohio, there are flocks around in winter, but they're sort of hidden away like in swamps or in like parks where there are lots of fruiting trees. And so in your backyard, you might go months without seeing one. So there's a point in spring where the flocks break up and the birds start spreading out and others come flying up from the north, you know, coming from Florida or the Gulf Coast states. And so there's this sudden arrival of robins all over the place. And, you know, you can see your first robin of spring on January 1st if you know where to look, but there still is this big arrival. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they fan out in the backyards across the country. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question to that. So do, how long does spring migration last for birds? Are they the same for all the birds or is it like a different timeline for different species? Well, that, that's really a great uh, point. I mean, the, the spring migration goes on for more than three months. It's, um, it's a long, like just, just where I am here, we see our first migrants around the middle of February and the last one's going through, oh, in, in early June. And it's different birds coming at different times. So, I mean, Perbita, you had uh, killdeers show up recently, didn't you? Oh yeah, that's true. I saw little pairs of killdeer, which I assume were couples, um, hanging out at a playground. Yeah, and that, that's a classic well, like early spring migrant. Mm -hmm. So For sure. Uh, for those of you who may be just joining us, we've got Melissa Villasenor with us as well. She's a Saturday Night Live cast member, a very talented uh, artist of many varieties, and she's been working on a drawing of Anna's hummingbird. How are you coming with the hummingbird, Melissa? Oh, wow. beautiful. Beautiful. Who, who comes up with these names? Wow. Who decides, <laughs> hey, she's an Anna's hummingbird. <laughs> I feel like that is one of the few birds with that's actually named after a woman. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, Prabita, you've written about how some birds get their names. Um, there's all kinds of reasons, but what are, how would you answer Melissa's question? 
Oh, um, Audubon, the big book. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of John James Audubon got to name a lot of birds because he described a lot of birds because he shot a lot of birds. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, but no. yeah, I think it's usually up to the person who does, you know, the scientific analysis and figures out what makes a bird a unique species. Um, and then it's kind of up to them to pick the Latin name and the common name. Um, is that correct, Kim? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the common names sometimes get changed, but there are strict rules about applying the scientific name. So, uh, Melissa, if it makes you feel any better, John James Audubon never shot any Anna's hummingbirds. Um, he never saw one in life. Uh, people sent him some uh, some specimens from California, so he painted the bird. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah. Melissa, you've got a flamingo that you drew as well, if I recall. Yeah. Why don't you take us over to your bird wall? You got it. Back to the bird wall. Flamingo. Very beautiful. Love it. I learned that they don't turn pink until I don't know. They're white for a little for a while as a little baby, right? Okay. And then when did they That's right. when they fall in love? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very beautiful thing, but Ken Prabita, why do why do flamingos turn pink? Uh, I just know that it's um, derived from their diet. So they eat a lot of shrimp and crustaceans. Um, but I don't know what the exact chemical compound is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, some, some uh, carotenoid pigment out of the crustaceans that eventually finds its way into the feathers. So yeah, they're, they're sort of whitish when they're little babies. And then you know, within a year, they start to develop a lot of the pink. Cool. I like, I like Melissa's explanation, though. It could be oh, yeah. for next yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, very... I realize, oh, I love you, mama. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna think about that every time I see a flamingo, Melissa. Yeah. Oh, and reintroduce us to your friend there, please. Okay, this is Penny. She woke up from her nap and now she's <laughs> on display. She's Ready a... for some attention. Yeah. Well, Melissa, we have a question for you from the audience, which Ooh. is, is there an SNL skit about birds? And if not, can you create one? If so, what would the skit be about? Um, uh, is there one about? Hmm. I don't know off the top of my head if there is a bird SNL sketch. There's got to be. But I know there is a, do you remember the Belushi sketch where he's a comedian in the forest and all the little animals are his crowd and they're just <laughs> like laughing? I know that that's a, that's a cute, that's a good one. Um, but I, I'll have to yeah. think about that, a bird sketch. And if not, then I, I'm going to create it. I'm going to create maybe a bird one about flamingos. Yeah, that would be good. And then maybe, yeah, I just share a bunch of what I think are facts. And everyone's like in the tour, like, no, ma'am, that's wrong. You know, well, it sounds like our audience would love to see that. Yeah. Um, I wonder yeah. if, if you know, Melissa, so one of your very famous impersonations is of Owen Wilson, the actor. Um, yeah. And you must know that Owen Wilson was in a movie about watching birds called The Big Year a few years back. Is it, what's it called? The Big Year? The Big Year, yes. You know I so haven't seen Owen, that? Really? Owen Wilson, Steve Martin, and Jack Black play these three birders who are in competition with each other to see the most birds across North America in a whole year. And it's based on a true story. There was a book written. Um, and so this film adaptation came out in maybe 2011. Um, so sounds like uh, given your interest, it might be something to check out. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you know I love <laughs> Owen Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> wow, we have another special guest tonight. Owen Wilson is yeah. with us. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I love bird watching. I bet he loves, I bet in real life he loves birds too i'd imagine yeah that's a movie i've heard, people have told me about that and um yeah I'll, i'm gonna maybe try to watch it later that's a great idea well we're all at home so time to catch up on the watching right 
True. Yeah, that's some birds. Um, I have more questions, uh, but there's also questions I know from folks. Um, sure, Christine, do you want to bring in a couple audience questions? Yeah, so someone asked, how has climate change impact bird migration? Um, and if it had, or how will it impact bird migration? Uh, yeah, I have little experience with this just because it's more me reading scientific studies that, you know, Audubon scientists are putting out, scientists across the world are putting out. Um, but there was one a few weeks ago that one of my popular science um, colleagues sent me about robins and, um, you know, these researchers put little trackers um, usually they look like tiny backpacks on uh, robins that were migrating and um, just found that over time their migration was shifting by, you know, they were coming up earlier and earlier um, by as much as two weeks. Um, so we're seeing gradual shifts in a lot of species um, or even just a lot of populations of species. Um, and it depends where you are and how bad of the impacts you're seeing from climate change. Um, but yeah, it's, it's happening. Uh, Ken, what have you noticed um, being by the Black Swamp Bird Observatory and the marsh there? Well, we've, yeah, there's, uh, there's detailed uh, bird banding research here. And so over time, it's going to be possible to analyze. I mean, the, this only goes back about 30 years for the records here. Um, there are some places where there are really long-term data sets where they can show that the spring arrival of birds has moved up by a week to 10 days. And it, it's interesting to think about how that happens. It's partly evolution, but, um, you know, because the, the birds that arrive earlier are favored, they get to the breeding grounds earlier and they get the best spots. Uh, but then also you have some situations like some big sandpipers called godwits that are migrating to Iceland and they're arriving earlier now, but it's not based on, it's not inherited. Uh, it's based on how early in the season the bird hatched. So it, it's bizarre. It, it doesn't fit with any of the theories about how birds would change their behavior. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to learn a lot uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, yeah. When I was uh, in high school and I was birding in Southwest Missouri, um, between that time and now, there have been some remarkable changes that have happened. Uh, one, a couple that I can think of, birds like chipping sparrows and black vultures used to leave Southern Missouri during the winter for the most part. Very rare to see during an Audubon Christmas bird count, for example. But now they're pretty expected. Um, the winters are just slightly warmer. Uh, almost to the point where people don't notice necessarily, but it makes a difference in the bird's ability to survive. Um, and as Prabita mentioned, there's a lot of Audubon science on this, which you can find on our website, uh, as well as uh, plenty of other research going on. Um, Melissa, let's go to another question from you. I know you came prepared with a list. How are pigeons able to stomach <laughs> trash? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. I have no idea. Just like humans are. <laughs> um, Ken? Oh, go ahead. How would you answer that? <laughs> well, birds can, they can eat a lot of different things. Uh, you know, with pigeons, you see them down in the dirt, like eating little tiny rocks and things. They've got They'll actually swallow tiny bits of gravel and they've got these like these rocks grinding around in their in the crop it's called and so they can eat stuff that's really gnarly and still manage to uh, to digest it. So birds eat an awful lot of things that the humans probably shouldn't. Now today sure. They're the most on the floor though than than flying right pigeons they just yeah, anyway, that's not a good question. <laughs> yeah, they, they primarily eat on the ground. You know, birds have all different places in the landscape where they primarily find their food. And the pigeons that we see in cities, rock pigeons, um, get most of their food on the ground. 
Um, you can see them picking up even, you know, little bits of French fries that somebody stepped on and kind of ground into the concrete. They'll pick out those little bits of starch. Um, it's pretty amazing how they find a way to survive and even thrive in what seem like very difficult environments. I think it's one of the reasons some of us really love birds like uh, rock pigeons and gray-tailed grackles, because they make a go of it in places that we share um, and that a lot of other birds can't thrive. And I think there's something called pigeon milk, if I'm correct. Um, is that something that pigeons feed to their babies? Like, I, I don't know what it comes from. This is my least favorite bird story. <laughs> 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 we can move on. <laughs> no, 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 please. People need to be enlightened. The world needs to know. Ken, do you want to take the pigeon milk thing or should I? Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, pigeons, uh, pigeons and doves uh, are able to create this sort of secretion uh, in their, the upper part of the esophagus. They can create this stuff that's sort of milky. You know, they eat like regular food, you know, French fries and things, and they can convert it. I mean, wild pigeons, you know, they, they eat like seeds and fruits and things, but they can convert it into this milky substance, and then they regurgitate it, which is a polite way to say they throw up. They regurgitate it into the mouth of the baby pigeons. It's very nutritious. And so baby pigeons and doves grow very quickly. If you've ever seen the nest of a morning dove, which is like a slightly graceful more pigeon, um, you know, the, the nest is terrible. It's just this flimsy pile of sticks. And so it's really an advantage for the baby doves to grow up very quickly uh, and be able to leave this rickety nest before it falls apart. So fortunately, they're getting this really rich, nutritious uh, pigeon milk from the parents. I don't know if I've ever heard Ken refer to anything a bird has made as terrible. So... <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is. So. <laughs> well, speaking of parenting, uh, let's bring in another guest. Um, so we've got Jennifer Bogo, who's uh, in charge of Audubon's magazine and website. Um, and I know that a lot of you tuning in tonight are parents who have uh, kids at home with you. You may be a caregiver, you may be a grandparent, aunt or uncle, um, and have kids in your home. And so we know that birds are a great way to get kids involved, keep their attention during those long days when you're trying to balance homeschooling and entertainment um, and also get your own work done. So Audubon has been compiling a set of resources for uh, kids to get them into birds. Um, and so Jennifer is going to walk through that resource with us. Everyone else can stay on. We'll have some more uh, Q&A with the full group, other questions coming in from the audience. But Jennifer, uh, let's hear from you. And I understand you might have a guest join you as well. I do. I have a super special guest as well. I'm Jenny. This is Jody. Jody, you want to say hello? <laughs> Jody, how Hi, Jody. Eight. Eight. Eight years old. So Jody is spending a lot of time with us at home um, because New York City schools are closed. And so we've been looking for fun things to do during the day, um, as many, many parents and families are right now. Um, and we're especially excited about things that connect us with the outdoors because we're spending an awful lot of time stuck inside our Brooklyn apartment. Um, so Audubon conveniently has a ton of great resources for kids. And so we decided, and here I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, we decided to create a page that um, collects all those resources and puts them in one place. So this is our new Audubon for Kids landing page. Every day, or every Wednesday, excuse me, every week, we're going to refresh this page with new content around different themes. Uh, week two, which we just launched, is all about owls, as you can see. Um, owls have a lot of super cool skills that distinguish them from other birds. They're also in a lot of our favorite books, right? And so they're a really fun topic for kids to explore. Um, so some of these activities, this is Intro to Alice. Some of these activities are actually adapted from Audubon Adventures. I'm going to show you this really quick because it's pretty cool. This is actually a magazine for kids that Audubon produces. It's used primarily um, by classroom teachers to teach science and math through uh, the lens of birds. Um, and you can actually sponsor classrooms to get Audubon Adventures for teachers or at this point in time we're also making it available so you can order it for home as well. Um, but we have that available for free download, um, each issue that's around these themes on this Audubon for Kids site. Um, 
And so Jody's been helping me test out a lot of these activities over the past couple of weeks. This first one, um, look, listen, mimic, measure, we did just today, right? This, this is an activity where you can listen to owl calls. Um, Melissa, you'd be totally into this. You can listen to owl calls right on this page. And then uh, you actually uh, look for household objects that are about the same size as different owls, our super second super special guest. <laughs> Uh, Jody, what are some of the household objects we compared owls to today when we were looking around? Um, a stuffy, mm -hmm. and another stuffy, mm -hmm. and there's a book, right? Yeah. And a big pillow guy thing. Yeah, so there's a pretty big difference in owl sizes, which was pretty cool to discover. And what we've done is we've actually taken these act some of these activities and we've um, adapted them so that parents and kids can do them at home without very many resources or materials, just using the things around your house. Um, we also did this cool handprint activity. This is a classic for uh, children everywhere. Um, but the twist on this is you can turn your handprint into pretty much any bird. And then we're also pulling content from across the Audubon network of educators. Um, this is a really neat video on owls and how amazing they are that dives into their different, um, why their bodies are so cool and unique. Uh, Christine did this with an educator from Audubon, Pennsylvania. And we have quizzes built right into the page. So this is a quiz where you can actually sort of test your owl knowledge. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's super fun. And this is one of, Jody. this is one of your favorite activities, right? I drew one. Yeah, you drew one. Let's show it off, actually. This is a, um, this is a video. So the illustrator and ornithologist, David Sibley, I'm going to hold this up and hold up your drawing, did a how-to on, nice. Oh, that's really good, Jody. Hello, I'm David Sibley, I'll just play and in this bit. video I'm going to show you how I draw an owl. This is a screech owl, and there are two very similar species of screech owls found in open woods throughout much of the lower 48 states and Canada. Owls are unique among birds. So this is, so there's a coloring sheet attached to it. Every week he's going to add a new um, bird and we can testify that they're great for uh, kids and adults. A lot of people have been um, posting their own birds with a sketch um, Sketch with Sibley hashtag on Instagram. Just so neat activity. I love how calming his his voice is. It just like I watched the whole video and it just like I could listen to him for like an hour just sketching and yeah. talking. It's totally five minutes of zen, no matter what your age is. It's great. Um, and then there's a really neat activity is just to create your own bird guide. Um, kids can take a piece of paper and draw a bird and write some cool facts about it, just with birds they see in their backyard, or in our case in Brooklyn birds out of our window right now. One bird we see an awful lot of are pigeons. Speaking of pigeons, this is a neat activity adapted from Audubon, New York. Um, pigeons, turns out, pigeons, it turns out, are super colorful. There's this amazing diversity of pigeons out there. And this activity actually walks you through some of those color morphs um, and teaches you how to identify pigeons. Um, and then this is an art lesson. This is the last, last activity I'll show. This is a really neat one. Um, it's, it's how birds get their names. Speaking of Anna's hummingbirds, this is an activity that walks through kids, uh, like teaches the concept of field marks and that some birds are named based on what they eat or how they fly. Uh, it doesn't uh, get too nerdy, but it asks kids to do is actually make up their own bird and then apply a name that fits that bird. And I think this is also a really great example of, uh, with all of these activities, parents don't actually have to have a lot of bird and nature knowledge themselves. You don't have to be a bird expert. The point of this um, isn't even to teach kids or parents, for that matter, how to identify birds. It's just to sort of be a companion in the curiosity about how to exploring the natural world. And so I'm going to share um, with you because we were so delighted that we were sent them. People have been sharing some of their bird um, drawings that their kids made. This one is a black-headed glider created by Oliver, who's eight years old. It is a carnivorous bird with an 11-foot wingspan that hunts multi-eyed deer and was inspired by its dinosaur ancestors. So, super cool. That's so specific. Very imaginative. 
presumably his sister River, who's uh, five years old, created this red winged bluebird, which is an insectivore different size wing to be more effective at swooping through the air and catching bugs. So the again the fun of this is and just kind of going moo. It was going moo. Was that part of it? Yeah. I saw it said moo. Oh, that's hilarious. And Jody actually uh, created a really funny bird that um, was part treehouse and part bird. It was also super creative. So um, we love getting this feedback. We love getting ideas and seeing what kids have come up with for this page. Um, tomorrow we're launching a super cool theme on spring migration. So we've been creating a lot of really neat activities and some more quizzes and games for this page. And I also want to make a point of um, showing you that, oops, sorry, the other way. So we also recently launched this page in Spanish. So there's a Spanish version of the Audubon for Kids page. Um, and that's also going to be refreshed every week. Uh, so we want to make this content as accessible as possible for as many families as possible, because we know, you know, there's inside. There's no reason we can't still try to connect with nature and spend this quality time with each other. So I'm delighted to uh, share this with you all, and happy to take questions or just kick questions on spring migration back to the group. Thank you, Jenny. Great. Thank. Thank you so much. We've actually gotten a lot of comments from educators saying thank you. So thank you for doing this. Um, the Audubon for Kids page is a great way to engage if you're a parent, but also just um, from doing things from home. And I think it's a great way to have fun and enjoy nature together when we're all in this time. Um, so for those of you, if you joined a little later, I want to reintroduce everybody. So on this call, we have Melissa Villasenor, a cast yeah. member of Saturday Night Live, and an artist and a birder. And we have bird experts, Ken Kaufman and Pravita Saha. And we have Jennifer Bogo. Um, someone actually asked you, Jenny, if you are the person behind the Audubon Photography Awards. Oh, my name is on it. I am one of the people that sort of help facilitate it. I'm definitely not a mastermind of it. But yes, the Audubon Photography Awards actually just closed yesterday. Uh, it's been rolling since January. And um, my team at Audubon Magazine uh, hosts the awards and we get all sorts of amazing entries from bird mm -hmm. photographers all around the country. And we're gonna be announcing the winners of the photo awards in the summer issue of Audubon Magazine, which is in July. And we'll have lots of fun galleries and things like that online too. Good question. That's Sweet. great. Thank you for that. Uh, so, Melissa, you're a bird artist among your many other talents. Uh, what did you think of some of those kids' birds drawings? I thought those are great. They're very, they're, I feel like, uh, yeah, they're really good. Um, I feel like I'm going to learn a lot from the kid Audubon pages because I think my brain is very childlike and the and the the simpler it is and more colors and <laughs> drawings the better for my brain I've noticed. So I'm looking forward to looking at at the Audubon for kids. It looks really fun. Um, and how is your Anna's hummingbird drawing tonight that you've been working on? How's it looking? It's good. I think it's done. Ooh. And I'll just cut it out. I think that's to show it's flying fast. Okay. I love it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Beautiful. I don't know. What are for you those gonna... of you... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Were you going to ask me something? My bad. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna plug your Instagram live bird drawing every Wednesday morning. So for those of you on Instagram, uh, you can follow Melissa at Melissa V Comedy on Instagram, and every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, Melissa will draw a live. Uh, live draw a bird and you can watch her uh, go along and talk about it and uh, you'll be doing that tomorrow morning. Yep, I'll be doing that you guys and sometimes I'll have comedians and guests and uh, it's a lot of fun, pretty silly stuff. But yeah, it's fun to find them around my house. Oh. <laughs> 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 Melissa, would you consider adding glitter to that hummingbird or you just want your bird drawing Ooh. to come up? No, she needs Ooh. glitter. <laughs> yes. I was looking at the photos of the Annas, and they're, oh man, they're so bright right here. Yeah, glitter would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Good call, Perbita. Yeah. 
Now, is this bird going to make an appearance on your bird wall, you think? Yeah, Bill, you'll have to find out and watch and see. <laughs> oh, uh, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, what well, bird can, do you can, think you guys are? Oh, that's my next. Go ahead. Oh, what oh, birds do we think we are? When this is over, because we've got our own bird wall going here, too. <laughs> oh, sweet. Cool. What birds okay. do you guys think it would be, you know? Ooh. A good question. What birds would we be? Who wants to go first? Ken, you must get asked this a lot. Oh, someone's um, so glitter, microplastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't go for a bird with glitter, but um, if I had to be a bird, I would choose to be a great swallowtailed swift living in Sumadero Canyon in Chiapas. Swallowtailed swift. Have you seen it's that like bird? the ultimate the ultimate flying bird and so i i just think having that experience uh, i can't imagine anything better oh that's beautiful ken yes <laughs> who else i don't know i mean I christine think what about you hmm that's also a good question i've never thought of that before um I'm thinking of the, so on our Instagram, we have a bird AR filter and actually tells you what kind of bird you are. And more often than not, I got tiny bird or goth bird. So it's pretty accurate. I would say a tiny crow. Okay. There's one of my favorite goth birds that's also tiny is called a cutthroat finch. Um, it, looks like it <laughs> has a cutthroat. Uh, it's not North American, but worth looking up on Google Images. <laughs> cutthroat what? It's a good one. Cutthroat finch. Finch, okay. I believe there's also a dove or a pigeon called a bleeding heart. Is that right, Ken? Am I remembering that right? Yeah, In the that's Philippines, right. I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I love exactly. that. So traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> The emo birds. <laughs> the emo <laughs> birds. I, I feel like I give a different answer every time I get this question. Um, but one of the birds I'm thinking about today in terms of what bird would I like to be, um, I'm thinking about a prothonotary warbler, which is this beautiful bright yellow bird that nests in uh, bald cypress tupelo forests in the south in the United States. Um, so these flooded forests along big rivers like the Mississippi and the Pascagoula. Um, and these birds are brilliant, like a little piece of bo broken off sunshine. Um, and they sing and sing and sing in these forests. And then during migration, we've, we actually have an Audubon project that some of our colleagues work on uh, that track the migration of these warblers. And what they do is they sort of uh, fly down from the Gulf Coast and they spend time in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. They hit some of the big islands in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and then they end up spending the winter down on the coast of Colombia in South America in the mangrove forests. Um, so I think that that's a great way to see the world and hang out in some really beautiful places. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that's come in from the audience, I think this connects to that because uh, the question is, what are some of the threats that birds face on their journeys and how can we help provide them safer passage? So when you think about a bird like a prothonotary warbler that spends time, you know, maybe in Louisiana or Missouri, and then it, it migrates through Mexico, Cuba, Jamaica, and then ends up in Panama and Colombia, that's a lot of different places to be spending time and a lot of threats it could face along the way. Um, Perbita, you've written a lot about bird migration. How do we think about those threats birds face and what we can do about it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those threats can be natural. You know, there's a built-in survival system, like we said, and there are going to be losses with every migration, um, especially during spring when you have the young birds that have just, um, or wait, sorry, <laughs> mixing it up. Uh, in fall, when you have young birds uh, hatching on their breeding grounds um, and then trying to make that very tiresome journey back. Um, you know, some might just not be ready for it. But then again, there's the human factor. And we have changed landscapes so, so much, um, either by building, you know, giant skyscrapers or putting up glass facades around, you know, our community centers and our homes. 
Um, those are very perplexing to birds, um, especially uh, in the midst of like a dark nighttime migration. Um, they'll, they'll either see the lights inside and fly straight into a window, um, or during the day they might, you know, fly up after recovering um, for the night and do the same. So that is expected to kill, you know, millions, maybe up to a billion birds each year just in North America. Um, otherwise, you know, you have predators, both uh, natural ones and, um, you know, ones introduced by humans like pet cats or feral cats um, and dogs as well. So. You know, as long as you um, keep tabs of your pets and uh, make sure they're not chasing down any tired migrants, um, that that helps a lot. Um, and then loss of habitat. And, uh, you know, that's something that birders can really, or bird lovers can really, really contribute to just uh, beefing up the habitat in their yards or on their fire escapes, even putting up a few um, plants that birds will love. Yeah, it, it can make a difference. Yeah, thank you for that. And as we continue the I Saw a Bird programming here at Audubon over the next few weeks, we're going to be dropping in um, activities and things that you can do to help birds wherever you live. So definitely uh, check out our website and stay tuned to the I Saw a Bird uh, program for more that you can do to help birds on their journeys. Um, so we have another great question, which is about birding in cities like New York, where I live. Before I answer that, Melissa Villasenor, have we gotten through all of the questions you came to get answered tonight? Yeah, I think that um, you answered for me like what I could do to, because I want to know what I could do to help birds on my own. Um, and I, I was, that's great to know I should get plants that they'll enjoy. And um, yeah, what, anything else can I offer? I did order a bird feeder too. That's great. Yeah, some extra food and water in your yard for birds uh, it keeps you entertained and it helps them out. But you're, you know, the point about native plants is a really good one. And if you look at Audubon's website and search for native plants, we have a program called Plants for Birds. And you can put in your zip code and you can find out which plants grow in your area that help birds by providing food for them all year long. Um, a lot of the plants that sort of come with the houses that we live in aren't necessarily the best plants to really help provide food and cover for birds. Um, so if you're looking to do a little gardening outdoors safely uh, during this period of time, uh, you can look up uh, Audubon's Plants for Birds program, put in your zip code and find out plants that'll help uh, provide more food and shelter for birds wherever you live. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a great great thing to do. Uh, and we'll, before we close the program tonight, we'll talk about a couple more things coming up to help. Um, but we had a question from the uh, participants tonight about birding in big cities like New York City, where I live. Um, so I mentioned at the top of the program that I saw a common raven this morning. Uh, and this, uh, this viewer said, well, I love ravens too. I often see red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, and crows when I sit on my seventh floor living room and look out the window. Um, so a lot of us, particularly those of us who live in cities, are doing a lot of bird birding out of our windows now uh, when we can't get out as much as we would like to. But I see so much here out my window in New York City. I see little flocks of juncos moving through the treetops like wind-blown leaves. Um, that's one of the first migrants that I see here. Um, I see a pair of crows who keep flying around the neighborhood looking for a place to nest. Um, and when you see a crow, you just know there's so much going on inside that head. They're sort of looking around and flicking their wings and interacting with each other. Um, in the little crook between two buildings across the street from me, there's a European starling pair that's building a nest. Um, so sometimes we can see rare and exciting things by looking out our windows, and sometimes we can just pay more attention to the most common birds that are around us all the time. Um, but as spring migration starts to deepen in April and May here, uh, you may see something in the tree outside your window that wasn't there the day before because it's on its way from South America up to Canada or Alaska for the summer to nest. Um, so certainly wherever you are, uh, don't despair. Keep an eye out the window because um, there's definitely something to see. 
Um, so Christine, we are probably starting to wrap up here. We're incredibly grateful to all of our panelists tonight. Uh, we'll say goodbye to you here before we break, but can you tell us a little bit, Christine, about what else folks can expect to see from Audubon over the next few weeks? Yeah, so we have a whole range of things planned to celebrate spring migration each week. Um, so first up, we have this thing called, we're doing birding happy hour and where it's gonna be socially distant birding. Um, and we'll, we'll be hosting this on Twitter every Monday. And it's basically, you can use the hashtag, I saw bird. Um, and it's a way to just share whatever bird you see out your window or your yard. Um, it doesn't matter how good or bad the bird picture is, or even if you got a picture, it's just a way for everyone to kind of enjoy nature together and share what kinds of birds they're seeing. Um, and then on Sundays, we'll be posting some soothing bird videos. And um, these will be from sites such as the Rose Sanctuary and Corkscrew Swamp. And we're endearingly calling this birdie ASMR because it's so soothing. Um, and then David, do you want to talk about what we're doing on Tuesday? Sure. On Tuesday, we have an Advocacy 101 webinar for those of you who are interested in learning how to speak up and use your voice to help protect birds and their habitats. Um, as we've talked about during the, the conversation today, there are all kinds of threats that birds face. And some of them are things that you can do something about personally in your own life. And some of them require collective action by our whole states or our whole country. Um, and so the Advocacy 101 webinar next Tuesday will tell you how you can put some new skills to work uh, on behalf of the birds that we all love. So we hope that you will uh, tune in for that as well. Um, and for those of you who are on uh, Facebook tonight, watching us on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment uh, with your question. We'll be dropping some links in about uh, where to find some of these resources. Uh, certainly let us know what you're seeing um, there as well. And then looking forward to next week, we'll be hosting these Facebook Live sessions every Wednesday, um, starting next week, even though today is Tuesday. But we have um, a special guest plan for next week as well. It's another fellow actress, and she's also an Audubon board member, Lily Taylor. And we were talking about native plants earlier, and we're very excited to have her on and share some of her experiences with native plants in an urban city. That's awesome. For sure. Mm -hmm. Way to go, guys. I'm, I'm really glad to be a part of this and, and to learn from you. And I'm going to keep learning. Thank you. Well, yeah. we hope you'll come back, Melissa. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, we wanted to end um, with, uh, uh, if you can do one thing for birds this week, what would it be? Um, so uh, we had a number of things actually, so we'll kind of um, have this feature every week, but um, if you can do one thing for birds this week, uh, uh, I'll say a couple and then Christine, we hope uh, you'll add a couple, but um, mine would be that I hope you join the Advocacy 101 webinar, and I hope that you share this with all of your friends and loved ones using the I saw a bird hashtag, um, because for birds, if we're talking about them, that's helping them. Um, so I think that we want everyone to share I Saw a Bird with your family and friends and networks um, and then join the Advocacy 101 webinar. Um, Christine, what else, what else do we want to leave people with before our panelists sign off? Yeah, so we've seen Melissa draw birds today. Um, and we also have some other um, arts and crafts type of things that you can do from the comfort of your home and that is DIY window decals. So because birds are migrating, they face a lot of threats along their way, and unfortunately, building collisions is a big threat to them. And you can make your DIY window decals really easily um, in a few minutes. We actually have a tutorial for that, um, which we'll drop in the comments. And it's a great way to just have some fun, make some art, but also help some birds along the way. I can't wait to make yeah, hand print owls with all my non-kid friends. <laughs> I need I to try that. that too. I've only done the turkey, so I like the owl idea. It's a really good idea. Yeah, well, these window decals, if you apply them the right way in the right places, which we've got instructions online to do, um, that can help keep birds from colliding with your windows. 
I would get a lot of questions about how do I stop birds from flying into my window. There's a few different ways to approach it, but this decal one, um, if you put them in the right places in the right ways, um, can really help make a difference. It's also, as Christine said, a really fun activity. So check for the link in the comments, uh, either on Facebook or here on Zoom, and you can, you can read up on everything you need to know. So uh, again, we've had a fantastic group of people here with us this evening. Melissa Villasenor, a bird artist and also SNL cast member. Prabita Saha, a senior editor at Popular Science. Ken Kaufman, a field guide editor, uh, artist, naturalist, uh, author. And Jennifer Bogo and her daughter, Jody, who uh, produce Audubon's fabulous magazine, Photo Awards website, uh, going through the Audubon for Kids <laughs> resources. So. Please keep your questions coming on the Facebook Live. We will keep up with what you're asking and um, maybe help shape future programs based on your ideas, comments, and suggestions. Um, let me give each of our panelists, starting with you, Melissa, a chance to uh, say a last word as we sign off. Oh, um, well, I just want to keep learning about birds, how to help them, and learn from you. Thanks for having me, and I, I'm going to keep drawing a lot of birds. And yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much. And I think thank I'm a you. parrot. I think I would be a parrot. I wanted to show that. Earlier. <laughs> That's a good choice. Oh, I can see that. I love bright colors. I like mimicking. So there you go. They're also super smart. And they <laughs> live for a long time. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> how, how old can a bird live? I know we'll get going, but. What's the oldest? Well, well, the, lar the larger birds live the longest. Um, <gasps> Prabita, you've written about wisdom, right? Do you want to tell a wisdom story? I was just thinking of her. There's this uh, albatross out in Hawaii. Um, her name is Wisdom, and she's a Laysan albatross. And she is almost 80 at this point in human years and still laying eggs and hatching babies, which just seems exhausting, but also power to her. Damn. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Awesome. And Ken, some of the parrots are also very long lived. I think the African greys have lived 80 or even 100 years, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah, some of the larger parrots. And we don't really know that much about their lifespan in the wild, but you know, parrots that have been in captivity have lived to be a century old. So it's a good choice uh, to be, you know, to be a parrot. All right, thanks. Yeah, long lived, bright colors, really smart, great at impressions. <laughs> it's all adding up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. This is so cool. Perbita, what are your closing thoughts for our audience? Uh, okay, I have two quick ones. Um, so first, definitely keep up your bird enthusiasm. Uh, it's just, yeah, like David said, if it's just looking out your window, looking at your feeder, watching a live bird cam online, there are plenty of those. Um, it's a really great escape right now. And it, you know, it's a way to stay healthy, either physically or mentally. Um, yeah, and you know, keep, keep logging in your bird observations. If you're on eBird or the Audubon app, we need that scientific data to find out what climate change is doing to birds, you know, even with this virus. So um, also I wanted to say that I thought a lot about what bird I would be. And at this point it would be a black skimmer, which is a really, really cool shorebird. Um, and the reason I chose them is because when they eat, they like, they skim the water. So they just open up their giant beaks and like fly through the water, like shoveling up stuff into their beak, which is how I eat. <laughs> um, and they also, everyone should look up photos of a sleeping black skimmer because they look ridiculous. They just like flop their heads down on the beach. And again, how I love to sleep. So <laughs> really relate to this group. Thank you. Very good. Ken, how about you? Parting words? Um, I just, um, just like to say that paying attention to birds brings more magic and more wonder into your life. When I was like six years old, I thought birds were just, just pure magic. And after years of studying and reading all these scientific studies and the more science you know about them, the more magical they become. 
So just at any level where you pay attention to birds, they're going to bring more wonder into your life. That's beautiful. Really is. Thank you. Very quotable. Well, yes, as always. Well, I just want to thank everybody again. Um, I agree with everything you've said. Look to birds. They give us hope. They give us joy. Um, they remind us about our place in the world and how their lives are connected to ours. Um, and we do hope that everyone will stay safe, stay indoors. Uh, we send all of our best to you who uh, may be struggling or have friends or family members who are affected by um, this disease. Certainly all of you who work in or have friends and family who work in healthcare industries, thank you for all that you're doing during this very difficult time. Um, so we'll be back next week on Wednesday, as Christine said. And Christine, take us home. Yeah. Um, I think everyone put it in great words. The only other thing I would add is that as we've seen, everyone can enjoy birds in different ways, whether like whether you're at home, whether you're outside, whether you're alone or with people. So I think birds are just a great way to appreciate nature and inspire others because they're all around us. So without further ado, thank you everybody for joining the call today and stay tuned for next week. Bye. Thank Thanks you so much. Good night.